Good evening. Welcome to the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute and the first of this fascinating series of public forums called the Illumination Series. My name is Gail Jennings. I'm an alumnus of the WEHI and I'm your MC this evening. It's wonderful that you could all come. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians and owners of this land, the Wurundjeri people from the Kulin Nation, um, and pay my respects to their elders past and present and any other elders from other communities who are here this evening. Now, tonight is the first of this fascinating series and it's on personalised medicine. It's illuminating personalised medicine. So you'll get the opportunity to hear from the horse's mouth actually what's happening in this area of research, how close to actualisation it is and how it's going to impact you. And then you'll have the opportunity to ask any question at all that you want from a panel of four, which will be extended out to experts in cancer, medicine, cancer law and um, ethics. But before we start, um, just a bit of housekeeping. The toilets are on the right, and there are signs you just go down the corridor there. Um, could you turn your phones to silent, please? But you can keep them on because there's live tweeting throughout this, and if you do want to tweet about the fascinating things that you're hearing, then the hashtag is hashtag WeHighIllumination, which is two eyes in the middle. Um, and in the unlikely event of emergency, please do what the wardens tell you. I'm um, told that there are going to be wardens here. Now, what is personalised medicine? Well, you're going to hear in detail what it is in a moment, but it's, it, it, you know, in, in very short term, it's um, the design of medicine to, for your own DNA, which contains the information uh, about your own wealth, uh, sorry, health and well-being. Health or wealth will be next, no doubt. So it's designing medicines for your own genetics um, so that you can optimise your experience from them. Um, so tonight, first of all, we're going to have two speakers. Um, they'll speak for about 10 to 15 minutes each. They're both uh, researchers in this area. Um, and they'll tell you exactly what is happening in personalised medicine, uh, what, what state the institute is at in terms of its research and when it might be a reality. Um, the rest of the hour, which will be the second half of the hour, 6.30 till 7, we'll be inviting our two other es experts up here on the panel and I'll be mediating your questions for that final half hour. So let's begin and let me introduce you to our first speaker. Professor Liam O'Connor is head of the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute's System Biology and Personalised Medicine Division. He's leading the effort at the Institute to improve the technologies and the tools that will make personalised medicine a reality. So please welcome Professor O'Connor. So, thank you for that introduction and thanks for coming, everyone. Uh, I'm in the... Uh, maybe unfortunate position tonight of being sort of warm-up man for, for the main act, which is the question and answer session. So I won't bore you too much. It's not like you're going back to school and you're going to go to sleep. But I do want to establish just maybe a little bit of the jargon because we use these terms interchangeably and um, they're sometimes not clear if you haven't heard them before. Every cell in your body has DNA in it. This is the genetic material. Uh, we will use the term gene to describe either uh, it's something that um, makes uh, somebody do a particular thing or have a particular characteristic or the physical DNA it itself. Every cell in your body has DNA and with a few notable exceptions in, in disease states and, and other some healthy cells, that DNA is identical in every cell in your body and it's constantly being made and remade. And the total uh, of all that DNA and all that genetic information is known as the genome. Now, the, the first human genome was sequenced in 2003. This effort began in 1993. It cost over a billion dollars. It was a huge international collaboration. It took some 3,000 or so people 10 years to sequence the first human genome. Uh, less than 10 years after that, uh, a couple of years ago in 2012, we could sequence a human genome for around $3,000 and it took one person about three days. Right now we're at, we're at the point of the $1,000 genome. And these, you know, I, I sometimes look at these things and it's, oh yeah, you know, a billion, 3,000, whatever. That's a million fold increase in, in a technical improvement in what we can find out about genetic material. And to give you some idea, what does a million fold increase in uh, efficiency look like? If there had been the same level of engineering improvement in the automotive industry over that period, what would a $200,000 car, for instance, now cost? 
20 cents. Spend a dollar and buy five. Uh, it's impossible to think that you could have this kind of huge technological change going on and not have an effect on society. And the same thing is, is happening now with genomic technologies and its effect on medicine, its effect on law and all the things you're going to ask questions about tonight. This kind of technical change coming through is, is going to change a lot of the way we think about genetics and medicine. So I won't keep you too much longer. Why am I interested in this? Uh, not particularly because I'm uh, just like playing with, with toys and like to do DNA sequencing faster, because of what it tells us about who we are as people and what, the, what disease looks like. We knew that there was enormous genetic diversity in the human population. We knew that already. What has been the, the real eye-opener for me in, in the field I work in, in, in cancer biology, when we started doing whole genome sequencing of tumors, and cancer is essentially a disease of the genome, so it's characterized by genetic changes, is that there is about, uh, there is probably more genetic diversity in some kinds of cancer than there is in this room tonight. And unless we can uh, tailor the, the therapies and, and tailor the therapeutic streams of people with similar cancers at a molecular level, we're constantly going to be playing catch up on, on that genetic diversity. So I'm going to leave you with just a thought. I'm going to end as Tolstoy began. Happy families are all alike, and every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. <coughs> healthy cells, healthy tissues, and healthy people in some ways are all alike. You don't really have to inquire any further. This enormously complicated machinery is working as it should. But when it doesn't work, it seems it doesn't work in an individual way for each of us, particularly in, in the area of cancer biology. So I'll leave you with that thought. Thank you. Thank you, Professor O'Connor. I wish we had people like you when I was doing my PhD. It was much easier. I had it very interesting. Our second speaker is Dr. Jayesh Desai, who's a medical oncologist at Melbourne Health at the Peter Mac, and he's a bowel cancer researcher here at the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute. Dr. Desai will speak about how personalised medicine is going to impact cancer treatments and the benefits and challenges that it will pose for cancer patients. Please welcome Dr. Desai. Well, good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you. So what I'm going to do over the next few minutes is just to perhaps now focus a little bit on cancer. I'm a, a medical oncologist. I'm a clinician who treats patients with advanced cancers. And um, a, along with a, a number of us, uh, including those of us in the room, of course, have a particular interest in seeing what people like Liam can provide to us to allow us to better understand this diversity and heterogeneity that clearly exists within cancer. So if we look at this picture here, if we imagine where we were in thinking about cancer a decade or more ago, for example, lung cancers were considered to be, we were able to break them down into three or four different types. And based on those types, it may have made some difference to what treatment we would use and perhaps might also make a difference to outcome. But clearly, that wasn't enough. Despite being able to subclassify a lung cancer into one of its three or four different types, there was a great deal of variation in how a particular patient would respond with that cancer type to a given treatment. And clearly, that was frustrating. With the advent of genomic technologies, and what that really provides for us now is a greater depth of understanding. So we can now, today, rather than thinking of this as being one of four different diseases where we could break it down further, we now know that there are probably 10 or 15 different types of lung cancers in the sense that we can subclassify them in particular ways. And more importantly, it's not just about being able to understand the differences between these and the way that they look um, uh, in, in, in a machine, but it's also understanding functionally what may make one cancer in a, in a particular patient different to the next patient who has a similar type of lung cancer. And if we can break that down, not just into its various subgroups, but functionally to understand what is making 
this cancer grow as opposed to the person next to, to that who also has a lung cancer is something that we're at the point of doing now. The next step, and this is really where we want to head to, is to break that down even further. You know, perhaps there would be a hundred different types of lung cancers we can break this into, whereby we are able to identify clearly that one particular lung cancer is defined in this way. This is what is making this cancer grow as compared to the next person who, for all intents and purposes, looks like they have the same disease, but clearly, in a very functional way, by looking genomically, we can actually understand that there are differences there. And that's really where we would like to be, because from a treatment perspective, that will hopefully allow us to be more tailored or more targeted, as we call it, in terms of what we use. So if we're able to identify this particular cancer being driven in this particular way by a particular uh, uh, genetic change compared to the, the one next to it, perhaps our treatments that we use can be more specifically tailored or more specifically targeted. And I'll, I'll touch on that in the next few slides. So really, as far as cancer medicine goes, particularly from a treatment perspective, in a, in a very broad way, that is, that is where we are today and that is where we would like to go. And we really are, at this point in time, right at the crux of where we need to be. We're starting to understand the diversity of cancer. We're starting to, to, to develop the tools that allow us to break it down in that way. And we're starting to use drugs that more specifically target those particular changes, those drivers as we call them, that makes a particular person's cancer grow. And the question is, you know, where do we go from here? How do we take this further so we can really start developing more effective therapies for our patients with cancer? And that's really where we are today. So I've decided to use a bit of an analogy to try and illustrate the point. Imagine that cancers were a bit like um, an electric circuit with a particular change in a cancer cell, that cancer cell is now switched on. And by being switched on, it goes about and does the things that it does. It grows, um, it, it, it spreads, and it causes the trouble that it causes. And it does this, of course, in a fairly unregulated manner. If we can understand where that critical light switch is, perhaps that may, may allow us to develop a treatment that is more specifically tailor it for what's actually going on with that cancer. So let's imagine, we'll take this a step further. So here we have an, a normal cell. <clears throat> and as Liam had said, all of our cells in our body have, have DNA. And there's a process that is normally fairly well controlled. So we have a cell that is normally controlled by a, a mechanism within, within our body. And that can either be switched on or switched off, depending on what you want it to occur. It's a fairly controlled mechanism. In a cancer cell, what can happen is you can get essentially a short circuit that occurs within a particular cell, and that cell now is no longer regulated by what's going on around it. Because regardless of what signals are coming from outside, that cancer cell now functions independently. A short circuit has developed within it. And really, if we're able to understand the changes that occur within that cell, and this is where sophisticated and sort of deeper technologies, you know, understanding what's going on at a DNA level, will start to provide us with information about what makes a particular cancer a cancer, now self-dependent, no longer reliant on what's around it, versus the normal cells that sit around it, which are obviously well controlled. If we can identify what that fundamental change is, we can perhaps use a drug, and this is where drugs called targeted therapies are being developed, we can use a drug to essentially come in and now circumvent that process, to stop that from happening. In other words, to break that short circuit that has occurred and to turn that cell from one that is on and doing the things that it's doing to one that's now off again. And a lot of the cancer therapies that we are now developing are based on this principle. So this all sounds very simple. You know, we do a test. We find the switch, we turn that switch off with a particular drug. In some instances, there are treatments that are working 
in that way. But in many instances, the challenge that we face today is that cancers are actually much more complex than that. And the reality is that cancers often have potentially multiple switches. And as we look in more detail, we are finding in many cancers, the common cancers that we see in our community, we are finding, in fact, that there are many switches that are on. But the next phase is to actually be able to better define in a functional way which of those, if there are three or four switches that are switched on, so to speak, we can do it, you know, genomic testing, DNA testing, and find out what those are within that cancer cell, you know, perhaps we can get a better functional idea of what that cancer is actually dependent on and then use therapies in that way. And that's really where we are at the moment. We're at that point where we're starting to better understand what is going on within cancer cells. In some areas, we're able to apply treatments that can work, um, you know, help to, con to switch that off and control the cancer. But the complexity that we face is clearly one that requires not just a simple approach, but actually a more complex approach than that. And it's therefore absolutely critical that the genome scientists and the clinicians and the patients all take part essentially in this partnership so we actually understand and, and, and really look in detail to, to, uh, to, to really get a sense of what's going on so we can take this a next step further, which is to obviously find treatments that are you know, going to have an impact. So just to summarise things, the key really is about understanding what's going on within the cancer, you know, using the technologies that are now being developed, that are becoming more and more readily available to us, and then applying that in a sophisticated way you know, and evaluating things on an ongoing basis. If we have a complex circuit, so to speak, how are we going to get our handle around that? How are we going to understand that? And, and clearly, you know, a lot of that comes, in, uh, uh, comes into in terms of the, the, the depth that we need to adopt to actually understand what's going on. But by doing that, you know, we're at a point right now where we've got these technologies that allow us to, in a much better way, understand what cancers are doing. We've got um, treatments that are being developed that target these particular changes. And the next step, of course, is to continue to refine this process. And it's a back and forth process. It's, you know, it's, it's about understanding the complexity of the cancer. It's about using particular treatments that are targeted for that. But it's about continuing to refine that process um, in a way that will allow us to hopefully develop more effective treatments and treatments that, because they are more specific, they act in more selective ways on the cancer cells and less so on the cells around there, in other words, the rest of the body, will hopefully develop therapies that are going to you know, um, um, be a much, uh, a much bigger step from where we have been with chemotherapy over the last um, 30 or 40 years. And that's really where we are today. But you know, from our perspective, from, the, from, from our perspective as a community, you know, what we really need to do is, is to work together to try and ch tackle these issues um, and you know to deal with these in a you know in a in a well coordinated way, and and that's really where we are at this point in time. So with that, I'll let you think for a while as we move on from there. Did you off? With that, he will finish for a moment. <laughs> and, um, well, that's great. We've got lots of time now for questions because I'm sure you have very, very many questions. So let me ask our two speakers to come up on the stage and I'll ask them also to be joined by our other panellists who are Associate Professor Lara Lipton. So Professor O'Connor and Dr Desso, would you be kind enough to come up onto the stage and <laughs> file through? Get your prize and go and sit down there. <laughs> um, and the other two members of our um, expert panel tonight for you to ask questions of are Associate Professor Lara Lipton, who's a medical oncologist at Melbourne Health, and she speciali specialises in um, familial cancers and genetic counselling. And um, our other expert is Professor Lauren Skeen from the Faculty of Law at the University of Melbourne. And her specialty is in medical law, ethics and genetic testing. So those are our four panellists. I can't see how they're organising themselves. OK, so it's Dr Desai, Professor Skeen, Professor Lipton and um, Professor O'Connor. And uh, 
who would like to ask the first question? Well, while you gather your thoughts, I will ask a question. Um, can I ask you, Dr Desai, um, which cancers, which kinds of cancers have this kind of personalised medicine already therapeutically being used? Um, the, the list actually is quite long. Um, so you know, some breast cancers, lung cancers, bowel cancers, uh, the, the list actually is quite long. You know, melanomas, for example, more recently, um, we've now got drugs that um, you know, target specific changes within the cancer and, and, and there are therapies that are being developed in that way. I think the point to make though is that um, as much as I've you know, talked about a few different cancer types, the reality is within each of those cancers there are subsets of those. So for example, not all breast cancers um, may be identified as having a particular change that we can then use a therapy for. There may just be a subset of those for which there is a therapy that we're able to effectively you know, target in, in uh, target a change within that way. Um, so it, it, it's, it's a growing area, um, and I'd say at the moment, you know, there are a number of cancer types where we are developing treatments in that sense. Um, and what's the outcome? Is the outcome better? Has it, have there been um, clinical trials to show that the outcome is better on the, with personalised medicine than with conventional therapies? So, so again, you know, a very general question. I guess the general comment I would make here is that um, there certainly are some improvements in, in terms of outcome and control of disease and so on. The challenge we're finding is that even when drugs work, they tend to work for a period of time. So there are not many targeted therapies, you know, without the odd exception, there are not many targeted therapies that are necessarily curing cancers. These are for patients with advanced cancers. Um, and part of that is because if we go back to the complexity that we have in cancer, if we can switch off a particular you know, genetic change, we can switch off that um, process from occurring, it tends to work for a period of time and then we find that resistance does develop in those cancers. So our, our challenge now is to try and remain a step ahead of that, you know, and continue to work to refine our understanding of, of you know, off cancers in that way. Mm -hmm. Can I ask a question of you? Maybe I will, I will drop the um, titles and call them by their first name because that makes it easier to have a conversation which you'll want to be part of perhaps. Um, Lara, can I ask you, your patients, what do they mostly... Uh, ask questions about when you offer them something like personalised medicine. What are the concerns or the greatest um, um, benefits for the patients from their point of view? Um, so I think a lot of our patients with advanced cancer particularly, we have limited things to offer them. And our, our traditional chemotherapies, and people ask me, what, what does it mean to be a chemotherapy? Well, basically a chemotherapy is a drug that damages the DNA in a fairly non-specific way. And these are the drugs we've used for 30 or 40 years. Uh, what we're trying to do now is to affect only the cancer cells, as Jasha said, be much more targeted towards them. And I think in general, people are quite excited about this approach, particularly when we can spare the chemotherapy and use targeted agents, which in general have quite a lot less toxicity because they're not using a scattergun approach to, to kill DNA. They're targeting more at the actual cancer cells. Um, and at the moment, it's also as Jasha said, there's been limited agents getting into the clinic, although many more than 10 years ago, and the uptake is very good. Um, people often ask about side effects and effectiveness are the two things that we're always talking about. What are the side effects versus the effectiveness? And these drugs have a very good profile in that way because they're less toxic than our traditional chemotherapies generally and may add something that the chemotherapies can't. And what is the process? Are there any questions here? Oh, yes. I won't, I won't keep asking questions. There's one here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. My name's Frances. I have a question for Dr Desai. How, um, how long does it take to develop a new therapy and get it through trials, given that your patient populations might likely be smaller in personalised medicine? Yeah, look, that, that's a very good question. So, you know, what if I can expand on the question a little bit, because I, I, it's, it's a really critical one and, and gets to the heart of the matter. Um, in a sense, if we are now thinking of a particular cancer and breaking it down into many, many different subtypes, 
we might, might find, in fact, that rather than you know, it affecting 100% of that cancer type, it may only be 1 or 2 or 5% of that cancer type. So the, the time it takes and the effort it takes to actually identify those patients, because the key here is to be able to do a test and try and identify the particular genomic change that occurs, so we can then use, hopefully, a drug that's going to work. Um, at the, the time, it, it you know, takes significantly more effort um, in being able to identify that. Um, but that's something that is happening more and more. And what it relies on is you know, a more complex medical system that allows us to, to do these tests. Right? It, allows on, it, it relies on collaboration. So this is no longer about us doing something at our own hospital alone, but it relies not just on local, but actually national and international collaboration. And with those efforts, that's happening more and more and more. And I think, as Lara had said, you know, because of, I guess, the enthusiasm for trying to take this more directed approach or more targeted approach, um, people are very keen to take part in these, in these programs. So clinical trials, for example, um, you know, people are very willing and keen to take part in those because, hopefully, the opportunity is one that's a positive one. Um, the time it takes to develop a targeted drug is, in some instances, I, th I think for the most part is probably similar to what it has been for chemotherapy, partly because when they work, right, and it, these clearly don't always work, when they work, we can get information and get answers more quickly because hopefully we are not treating a large number of patients with only a few that may respond, but hopefully a smaller number of patients with a larger percent that may respond. Did you want to add to that, Liam, at all? No, no, I think that's, uh, that covers it. Question here in the middle. Thank you. A uh, very basic question. Are these cancer cells endemic? Or is it uh, as a normal cell, which might be particularly vulnerable, susceptible? Uh, a, a normal cell which uh, uh, may be uh, susceptible, there may be some inherent weakness there, by through cell division that uh, a mistake uh, occurs and, uh, and uh, the result is a, is, is a cancer cell which then may need to be turned on through some other environmental influence. And the second question is, uh, uh, in families where there is a history of uh, one cancer or another, uh, does the uh, offspring have any chance of avoiding uh, falling prey to a cancer? Is there some way, for example, of uh, uh, not being in a stressful situation, or you know, is there, is there some way one can avoid this? Can I can I divide that into two? Then the first question, perhaps, to um, Liam, and the second one, perhaps, to Lara or. So the first one is, you know, are cancer cells endemic or are they caused by um, environmental... Well, the, the answer is a, a combination of, of both. Um, yes, uh, there are inherited predispositions to cancer and inherited susceptibilities, but you need the right kind of environmental trigger. Uh, so somebody with, with my skin should probably stay out of the sun. Uh, it doesn't mean I'm, I'm predestined to, to get skin cancer, but I certainly have more of a predisposition to it than somebody with, with different skin, for instance. Um, so in terms of, of familial cancer, it generally in, in the common cancers, bowel and breast, for example, we think about 30% of them may be due to inherited factors, which inherited DNA factors we've gotten from our parents. And we have only accounted for about 5 to 10% of that 30% now. But generally what, what the situation is, is that people have inherited a copy of a gene, a normal gene, that has a, a change in the DNA, a change in that code that Liam spoke about, which changes the product of that gene and makes that cell prone to cancer. So that change is in every cell of the body but, for example, let's think about BRCA1, which Angelina Jolie had. That's in one, in one particular gene, there is a mutation, which leads to an increased risk of breast and ovarian cancer. Now, if we have a, a lady who comes from a family with a lot of breast cancer, they know that the family's predisposed, 
we can take a blood test from the, one of the people with breast cancer and look at that gene and see if there's a, a change in that gene, a mistake or a mutation in that gene. And if we can find it, we then have a tool by which we can check every member of the family to see if they've inherited that, that copy of the gene which is faulty or not. And if they have, we can screen for breast cancer, we can remove ovaries prophylactically, we can do surgery for the breast. So it's all about trying to work out what each individual's risk is. So somebody who has not inherited the copy of the gene with the mutation has a normal population risk of breast and ovarian cancer, so we don't need to do anything special to manage their risk. Um, and that's an ideal situation where you can find the gene with the mutation and we can alert everyone in the family who has that and take preventative action. Um, but as yet, there are still lots of families out there that might have a lot of bowel cancer, a lot of breast cancer, a lot of some other cancer, and we can't yet find what the gene or genes is that's caused it. And there's a lot of work going on in that area to try to identify new predisposition genes, genes that will increase a person's predisposition to one or, or more cancers. Thank you, Lara. There's a question here. I need to get it back. And then any, uh, put your hand up and I'll stockpile you. <laughs> okay, you next. Well, I think this is still Dr. Uh, 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 Dr. Jayesh or Liam. Um, part of what I was going to ask has been preempted, but it seems to me that um, we're not dealing with the possibility of a cure yet at this stage. Uh, so that it's really returning a Tolstoyan unhappy family to a happy one by drugging them in one sense, to use the analogy. So there's no prospect yet of thinking of being able to cure these situations. Is that correct? Um, I wouldn't say there's no prospect. Um, I think, in a sense, what, what targeted therapies are doing at the moment? And, and again, you have to understand, I'm, I'm being very general in, in what I'm saying here. So you can't apply that to particular situations. You know, there may be exceptions to this, of course. But as a general principle, what we find is that with targeted therapies, what they do when they work is they, they, they switch the cell off, right? They stop the cancer cell from growing and doing the things it does. But for the most part, as you have correctly pointed out, they don't kill the cancer cells. And really, if we want to cure someone with a, an established cancer, we need to essentially kill every cancer cell that's there. And, that, and that's where we are at the moment. And, and I think the next phase is to find ways of combining these targeted drugs that, in a sense, you know, find a way of stopping that cancer from doing what it's doing, but perhaps finding second, second things, so combination therapies, as we call them, but second things that add to that that may drive that cell from being one that's been growing to one that's now stopped growing and it's sort of quiescent to one that actually is killed, right? that actually dies. And, and, and that's really where we are at the moment. Now, there are some cancers. There's a particular type of leukaemia, for example, called chronic myeloid leukaemia. And there probably are patients being cured now. And I say probably because these treatments have only been around for a decade or so. And, you know, but there is now an impact being seen in countries like the United States where these therapies have been around for a little bit longer, where you know, the actual survival rates are now being impacted when we're looking at you know, population data for that particular type of leukaemia. So we, you know, I, I think um, the, 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 the part that we need to temper in terms of enthusiasm is exactly as you say, we aren't curing people at the moment, even when the therapies work, right? Um, but at the same time, I think we're a step forward from where we were and hopefully, if we can get smarter about working out ways of not just switching these cells off, but actually, you know, killing them, probably by adding things to it, maybe we'll get to where we really want to get to. Laura, would you I'm, like to add something? I'm, I might just add to that that one of the reasons that we, we, we're at the moment working out, as Jay says, what works, what doesn't, the next thing to do is to bring these drugs into earlier phases of disease. So to try when people are at an earlier stage of disease to affect cure. And then there is actually one example in a fairly rare kind of sarcoma where an amazingly, affected target, amazingly effective targeted drug was found in metastatic patients. 
And then they did trials using it in people who'd had the cancer removed before they relapsed with metastatic disease. And we think they actually are saving some lives by people not relapsing. So once we've got the drugs, then we've got to move them into an earlier phase of the disease. And so that, that's a, a whole new lot of trials that has to be done and it's, it's a slow process. Liam, would you, can I just ask you to, um, just to top that up in terms of research, how far are we and what, will it, what kind of technology will it take before we're able to have personalised killers, oh. cancer killers? Well, <laughs> well, well, I mean, one of the things you've, you've been hearing is the sheer diversity of, of what, we, what we previously called cancer. We're learning that at, at the level of DNA, uh, it's uh, an, an immensely complicated group of diseases, or all of which look similar at, at, the, at, the, at the gross level. So uh, how far are we from doing this? Uh, as we gather more and more information, we get better and better at it. But it's, it's complicated. It's way more diverse than we thought. I know when I saw the first data that came in from sequencing uh, the, the DNA of cancers, uh, like everybody, I was staggered by just how many changes there are and just how complicated it was going to be to try and figure this out. But at the same time, a kind of light bulb went off. I thought, oh, no wonder so many of our therapies don't work on, on as many cancers as we thought they would. Because, uh, you know, it's, it's a much more complicated and diverse group of diseases that we're treating. So we, we are getting there. It's not easy, and there isn't going to be a magic bullet, but bit by bit with things like CML, with things like sarcoma, well, I think we're going to move from it being a, a deadly disease to a chronic and manageable condition to a cure. Wow, that's interesting. There's a lady up the back first, and then we'll come back down here. Uh, sorry. Um, given the relatively targeted nature of personalised medicine, what's the financial incentive to actually do the research? And given the, how money actually drives drug research, what's to prevent the drug company from patenting the test? making it unavailable for everybody else. Would that be a loan? <laughs> <laughs> That's a lawyer's question, isn't it? Ah, law and money, they go together. <laughs> they do. It's your turn. Um, well, although you say that the patent will stop other people getting it, um, patents are designed to make things available, but you have to pay for them. So a patent, contrary to what many people think, is not ownership of something. It's a, a right to exploit an invention for a limited period. Um, that said, it is true that, that drug companies have sometimes charged so much for access to the new drug that people are not prepared to pay, people and, and third party payers are not prepared to pay the amount that's um, asked. Uh, with regard to what's, what in incentive is there to do the research, um, I think that the re research is its own incentive. Uh, although there's a lot of money um, spent in the research and the patent system is designed to reward the work that's done, uh, which is so expensive, but once the work... Uh, the, it is, there is an incentive to find out which drugs are going to work for which patients. And over time, that will return a, a financial reward for the person who does that work. Um, it's commonly said about personalised medicine that in the next generation, it will seem as old fashioned to give the same group of patients, like in the slide of the crowd, the same drug for a particular condition as somebody walking in front of a car carrying a red flag. And we could see the changes uh, that are taking place so rapidly. And so I think that those are incentives regardless of the possibility of um, the financial rewards, which I think are still great. Question at the back. Um, I think Lara's partly answered my question, which is, are you only using these targeted treatments for advanced cancers? And if so, is that because they're still really at the clinical trial stage? Um, and I think Jayesh may, may want to comment. Um, but it, it is true, when we have somebody who is effectively cured from their cancer, say a lady who's had a breast cancer removed and we're trying to add a little bit to her cure rate, 
um, with a treatment. There's probably two problems in adding these newer agents. One is that without a long history of doing no harm, you don't want to at all endanger that person who may well be cured without any of your treatment. And secondly, trials of that nature take a very long time to give you a return because, say, a lady with breast cancer, it may take them 10 years to relapse. So you have to do the trial over five years and then follow it for another 10. And when drugs are in develop development like this, people want answers quickly. So they're looking for effectiveness, um, you know, over a year or two rather than taking the, the longer view. But if something proves to be very good for a metastatic breast cancer patient, you can be quite sure that they will design those trials to put them into treatment after curative surgery. I don't know if you want to a question yeah, here. No. And then there. I'd like to ask whether the um, condition of the body in which this personalised medicine um, takes place plays any part. Older body, younger body, a body with multiple diseases. <laughs> Interesting question. Who'd like to take that, Lara or Jash? Um, I, I can start. Um, uh, look, look. That's um, you know. I think the answer to that is is probably the same as the answer it is for any condition that we have. You know, there's there's always the um, the, the question is always one about um, you know it, with a given person who has a particular disease, it's you know what's the risk versus benefit of using a particular treatment to treat you know what may be there. Um, so, you know, I mean, Lara and I are both clinicians. You know, we both treat patients with cancer. That's what we spend most of our time doing. And, you know, that value judgment that we make together, we being the patient and, and, and ourselves make, is, is, you know, exactly as you think it is. Um, I guess if we have treatments that are more effective and have less side effects, then perhaps that may mean that people who are perhaps a little bit sicker to start with you know, more affected by the cancer or perhaps affected in other ways with other, with other illnesses or even age, um, that there is potentially more of an opportunity to, to try and help that person. I mean, that's the ideal scenario, um, you know, and, and that's, that's, I guess, that discussion is one that we always enter into in that way. Okay. Um, Question here and then down here. I was wondering if you could comment on the application to other non-cancer areas of medicine, so what progress is being made in, for example, Alzheimer's? That's an interesting question. Who, who's, <laughs> is Liam the person for that or is it Lara? Yeah, you might be uh, the well, <laughs> the, the answer is yes, uh, uh, the pr progress is being made. Uh, in, in, it, it's easier in, in some ways because uh, with, with cancer and, and the genetic changes that happen during cancer, it's, it's a moving target. As, as you're drugging a cancer, it's constantly developing resistance and finding new ways to evade it. That isn't the case with, with a lot of other diseases. Um, one of the things that, that makes targeted therapy for other conditions uh, tougher to tackle is that we don't have enough of this very detailed genetic information yet about a whole lot of people. We're still learning the difference between ordinary human genetic variation and just what's out there in, in the population and, and where that kind of veers over into a disease state or a disease predisposition state. So uh, I think the answer is yes, they will come along, um, but we probably need more data. Uh. Uh, I think the next question was down. This lady here. In the... I have a question for Professor Lipton. My oncologist has mentioned a group of drugs called PARP inhibitors. Would you be able to explain them to me, please? That, that's, a, that's a really good question for this forum, actually, because the, the PARP inhibitors are a class of drugs that have been developed for effectively ladies who have mutations in the BRCA1 and 2 genes, which I just mentioned in the context of Angelina Jolie. And very clever scientists have worked out how that mutation causes a cancer in the cancer cell. And they found a drug that will exploit what, that, what the mutation does in order to kill those cancer cells. So it's a highly targeted drug that will affect cancer cells in people who have that germline mutation. 
and I, I should just explain, we, we, we're talking about mutations a lot here, and there's really two different kinds of mutations. One of the ones that I mentioned, like in BRCA1 and 2, which come from mother or father and they're in every cell of your body. But we also speak a lot about mutations in a cancer, and these are mutations that have just developed in your cancer and they're not in all the other cells of the body. So this is a drug for ladies who get breast cancer in the context of having a germline mutation in every cell of the body. And they've been very successful in breast and bowel, oh, sorry, breast and ovarian cancer developing in ladies who carry a mutation in BRCA1 and 2. And that's about 5% of breast cancers and about 10% of ovarian cancers. They're not yet on the market, but there are trials still, still going on, trying to prove exactly what their, their place is. Mm, that's very interesting. Thank you. There's a question over there. Um, my question is similar to one already asked in the context of, do you believe that personalised medicine can be a, applied to other sorts of diseases, and I think particularly of viral com, uh, conditions in which I have very recently, <laughs> 60 days away from home with very severe pneumonia contracted in New Zealand on a bus trip, um, and I wondered in terms of the, the way they work through it, other than looking at your cardiac function and basic things like that, and having spent two and a half weeks in ICU and four weeks in acute medicine, I'm lucky to be here today, thanks to uh, modern medicine, medical science, I, I just wondered if uh, the sort of areas we're looking at today can in fact be applied, because pneumonia, serious pneumonia with, with other bacterial uh, conditions as well, leaving you with situations of pulmonary fibrosis and coughing and, and so on, um, can be applied in any way through this thing of being able to really understand which viruses apply in the condition of pneumonia, which has a very high morbidity and, as you know, mortality rate. That one for Liam? Or would that be one sure. for someone to answer? I was just going to say, in, in terms of viral infections, this ability to sequence the whole genome has been very helpful because um, you, it's a bit away from pneumonia, but viruses like HIV, hepatitis C, the sequencing of the virus's genome has led to new treatments for people whose virus has become resistant to current treatments. Um, but I don't know much about how it's influenced pneumonia, which is often a bacterial um, problem. Well, I mean, there have been... I mean, the technology itself for, for sequencing... Uh, DNA is so sensitive and so fast that it is being used to rapidly diagnose which kind of bacteria or virus you're infected with. And there's also this, this notion of, of host factors and, you know, you, your predisposition to it. Some people can be, um, you know, we've known for a long time that uh, your immune system depends on what things you've been exposed to but also what you were born with. Uh, and the ability to really ask those questions really quickly is coming about. But certainly in terms of diagnosis and, and tracing outbreaks of, of bacterial outbreaks, this technology is being used all the time. I think you've answered precisely because the emergency situation is there right off with serious pneumonia. Mm -hmm. And then intubation, re-intubation, all that sort of thing. They just have to work so quickly at it for you to survive. Mm -hmm. Like Another question here in the middle. I'll give you my, you know, just having a, a distinguished lawyer on the most distinguished medicos and scientists leads me to ask, uh, are there ethical problems that the, the lawyers have been studying? But just in a nutshell, could you tell me what they are? <laughs> <laughs> there are many, aren't Thank there? <laughs> so Lauren, over to you. Thank the ethical you for issues. The question. One of the things I've been thinking as I've been sitting here is that I speak at many public forums and many of the questions are usually legal ones or ethical ones. And tonight, you know, we've been here for most of the time of the session and what people want to know is, you know, what is the development of the research with regard to personalised medicine and particular applications of it, how long is it going to take and... You know, that sort of thing, which is not surprising. I mean, these are very good questions. There are ethical questions, as there always are, which are reflected in legal questions. Um, one of them is what relates to the type of research 
that is necessary to do the personalised medicine. So what you really want to find out if you're going to do this thoroughly is to find out, first of all, all the different types of cancers, if we're looking at cancers in the way that we've heard tonight, but also to find out all sorts of things about the patients. And it would be interesting to know about the patients, not only what you're able to see in patients that are coming um, with particular cancers for treatment, but in other patients who don't get sick, the whole, it's the whole population. So what is it about some people that, that get cancer and the cancer develops and then they respond to particular drugs and other people who don't get those cancers? So to do this, one of the ways that they do research is to es establish biobanks with uh, a large amount of information, which includes tissue samples that are donated by people who are healthy as well as people who are sick. And then they ask them a lot of questions about their lifestyle and their background and, and their um, pedigree, their genetic pedigree and other medical factors. And all that information is stored to be collated with information about cancers in this context, but other medical conditions. And you can see, as I described this, the huge advantages that this system has in providing information. And I think that every doctor who gets information from this should be writing about this and telling people the ad an enormous advantages of having a repository like this. But of course, other people are worried about the security of the information and if it leaks out, um, potential uses of it and whether that's going to be prejudicial for them. So they worry about whether um, their employer will find out and even more, perhaps, their insurance company. Um, with regard to health insurance, there's, there's no risk because everybody has the same access to health insurance. But for life insurance, if information is found out and not revealed to your life insurer, um, you may find that when you come to claim on your life insurance policy, the company won't pay out. So these are very complex issues. They're things that we should be talking about as a community, but I'm not at all surprised that you've come tonight wanting to hear about the cancers and not worrying about <laughs> these potential risks. Uh, there's a question here. It these Sorry. are social issues and that, you know, if it's insurance companies act like that and society should be against insurance companies and act so <laughs> frequently. Seriously, look, every time they've mentioned you, the whole audience has laughed cynically. <laughs> and, I think that, and that's true. And I think we're getting a more and more cynical view. <coughs> I mean, you're protecting the idea of make a research to make money out of this, that strikes the average person as disgusting. Do you know where I'm coming from? I don't mean this personally, but it strikes us as something really venal. And, um, you know, OK, that's enough. My wife's told me to stop. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can't get into a, into a lecture defending the life insurance industry. <laughs> no, <laughs> my question cool. is more about carcinogens and co-carcinogens. And how many do you come across that where you're really aware that a person may have actually come across that and that's actually caused, been the cause of the cancer wherever it is? And therefore you may have a slightly different cancer for A to B to C within the same organ. Well, these are things that we don't know but, but are being researched. And you need the largest possible population yeah, but and as much your... information as possible to yeah, do Yeah, but from your questions of a person's lifestyle, um, you'll never ga gather that because they wouldn't have known. I, th I think I should point out that Lone is a professor of um, law and ethics. You're talking about the people who are gathering... Oh, no, well, I'm sorry. I'm giving it to the whole... Uh, for. So yeah. you're talking about in terms of your research, Liam, for example, uh, or, you know, clinical research would be probably more Jess, wouldn't it? You're looking at all the other triggers, which is to do with people's uh, experiences, environmental triggers. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think uh, just, just as, um, as, as clearly one of the messages that's come about is the complexity of cancer. I think the complexity of the environment around us also makes it difficult as well. I mean, they're the obvious carcinogens that we're all aware of, you know, cigarette smoking, for example, right? Um, when you start talking about other things that we're exposed to in the environment, I mean, there's a sense of 
um, you know, there's obviously a perception that there must be things in the environment that are leading to, for example, you know, why have bowel cancer rates gone up, you know, dramatically, particularly in the westernised world? Or why is a particular cancer now more common than it was, you know, 50 years ago when, you know, the only thing that seems to make sense is, is the environment around us. But actually then taking it from that to identifying what specifically that carcinogen is, is actually very difficult. And I think as, as Lauren had said, you know, that requires actually, you know, very large population-based studies with a tremendous amount of detail that's collected and understood about the environment. And I think as you have actually said, you know, we probably don't always have that information. Um, but I guess it's a stepwise process as much as anything. Location, of course, is one. It's very... Uh, a good one, but I can't think of any others. No, well, well, I think, you know, if we, it, in, in many instances, cancer may be a multifactorial disease, right? It's not just one thing that causes it. There may be a number of things that causes it. And how do you break that down and define what each of those things are? That's actually quite difficult to do. May I ask her, may I make a little a comment here, which is um, I hear from colleagues that other nations are actually very good at having these big biobanks, that they're not worried about privacy and therefore they've got very good epidemiological data and they've got, uh, you know, a very good research base and Australia is a little more shy about it that our privacy seems to be an issue that's holding us back in getting this information. Would that be fair to say? I, mean, oh. I, 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 think that, yes, I think that Australia is well placed for this sort of research. Um, we have a tradition of um, not having laws that prevent the handing round of genetic information in families. Uh, we have an exception in our Privacy Act where doctors can disclose information to close blood relatives, even if the person tested doesn't want that to happen. Uh, in America, if you compare the American situation, they have very strict privacy protection and everybody's medical information is theirs to veto if, as they wish, even if their close blood relatives really need that information for their own health care. So I think Australians generally support medical research and it's very important for the doctors here to keep talking about the need to get this sort of information, not just the doctors, everybody. And this is really basic research that we've got to be doing because it's going to help improve the, the, the health of everyone. Yes, can, a I, can I just say oh, one other thing about Yes, biobanks. Lara, while we get the other question. I, mean, yes, I think Jayash and I have found over the years that almost nobody refuses biobanking. Everybody, almost 99.9% .9 of people when approached says, of course you can have my data, of course you can have the tissue. I think funding and finances have been over the last, well, 10 years that I've been involved in this in Australia have been an issue. And in some countries in Europe, creative um, ways of financing such uh, collections of material have been put in place, sometimes even with industry input. Um, I think the will is here in Australia. I think people want to do it. But I think we've had some stop gaps getting continuous funding because these things are not self-sustaining. They need they need financial input. Okay, thank you. Um, I just should we've got probably time for a couple of questions. So we've got one at the back here. I've just got just a quick question to uh, Professor O'Connor. Given the need for um, the a scale of data you've referred to, what is the current level of or scale of data that you have and what would be optimal for benefit, you know, um, benefit, wide benefit rather than, um, yeah, I'm just trying to get a handle on exactly how, how, how big this challenge is. Uh, yes, uh, it's a big challenge in, in terms of, of data uh, and, and, and data management. Um, it's a shrinking one because the technology is improving all the time. Uh, the, the DNA sequencing technology is, as you can see, squarely follows this Moore's law. It, it's getting, you know, 10 times cheaper, at, at 10 times faster all the time. Um, so in answer to uh, how much information is needed, uh, really how much, it, it, it depends on it, 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 there comes a point where it's going to be economic and, and make sense from a health point of view as well uh, that there will be a great deal more genomic information gathered uh, as a matter of course because it turns out it's going to be easier, faster and more accurate to do genetic, to sequence the genetic information from somebody 
b before any of these diseases arise and then you don't have to wait a long time. Uh, in the particular area of cancer, uh, one of the things that we're finding is that it's changing so quickly uh, that we're, we've been taken aback by, by just how hard it is to keep up with a rapidly changing and mutating cancer. So in terms of the human population, uh, I think the time will come before we know it when there is widespread uh, genomic information available. Um, in terms of continually uh, sequencing cancers as, as they change and recur, uh, th that's uh, going to be more challenging in, in the shorter term. Thank you. I think there was a last question over here somewhere. Yes, here. Thank you. Can you uh, tell us a little bit about autoimmune diseases? So the question was, how will this make an improvement in autoimmune diseases? In particular, inclusive body myositis. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, that particular one I'll uh, pass over. Genetic predispositions. <laughs> I don't know of any genetic... Pre I, I don't know, in terms of inclusion body myositis, I, I don't know where the, where the research in, in, in that is, but certainly... Um, Immunology is making some strides in autoimmune diseases, and that's not so much sequencing, but new generations of antibodies being used to treat rheumatoid arthritis and other connective tissue disease. But I, I just don't think I have the expertise to really answer answer that question. So I think our panel is fairly cancer specific in the personalised medicine. Um, Oh, it is time anyway, so um, I'd like to thank you very much for your interest and your fabulous questions, and I'd like to particularly thank our fabulous uh, speakers and panel tonight, and if you'd join me in thanking them, J.S. Desai, Lauren Skane, Lara Lipton and Liam O'Connor.